So Peter Wilkerson, are you an optimist or a pessimist on the future of journalism? So I'm an optimist. I think there's a strong future for journalism. And the example I'll use is what happened to documentaries at the turn of the century. The bottom fell out of documentaries um, or making money out of documentaries at the turn of the century. And so people like me went off into other directions. Um, but documentaries have now come back really strongly because people want content. And I think the same will happen with journalism. And the other factor with journalism is that people who want to be journalists are really committed to it. It becomes a passion. They want to catch the bad guys or create change or make create a better society. Now, the world of journalists and the press is certainly facing unprecedented disruption. And look, some would say that the trust is quite low at the moment. Um, so throwing a lens over you know, the, the traditional media model. What we, what's the biggest opportunity the Metro Daily and Weekly papers have in the, uh, the modern media marketplace? Well, I think, um, so we have published 17 Future of Journalism episodes and recorded 21. Almost everyone agreed that, um, that trust is the big issue. And um, I think I can summarise that by saying the future of journalism relies on journalists being very good, being better at what they do. And that is providing accurate information, holding people to account and distilling complex issues. The, the, the umbrella that sits over the top of that is making communities stronger or making societies better or however you want to say that. And I think a lot of people hope that in the future, journalists will run a ruler over each of their stories and say, is this story structured in such a way that, yeah, sure, chase the bad guy, but are, am I creating a better society? So what would you say is the major opportunity for the traditional metro and daily uh, week? So the collective view is that their future is going to be under a lot of pressure. And the collective view is that size matters. So big publishers, global publishers like the New York Times are destined, this is the sense, are destined for success. So the global public, the New York Times currently, 16% of its audience is outside the United States and it has 1.6 million subscribers. So it can afford to employ a lot of journalists. And remember these traditional publishers provide information across the board they provide information about everything to everybody, and that's a very costly exercise compared to, say, um, a niche publication that looks at the stock market. The challenge is to know what the minimum audience is for that kind of traditional publication. So is Sydney or Melbourne a big enough audience? So is there a long-term future for the Sydney Morning Herald and the Age? We just don't know. I mean, the reality is we just don't know yet. What um, um, and and we can't talk. We can't say well, current circulation is fine because we are part way through the disruption, which really started in earnest in about two thousand and four, and we don't know where it's going to end. And the competition is coming from the big global competitors and from the niche publishers. So there's a lot to go on this and a lot of unknowns. Well, when we look at the niche publications and. and the movement, the disruption to, or to online offerings. What do you see is the likelihood that there'll be a continued proliferation of these specialist digital uh, media marketplace offerings? Yep. Now, here's the magic and the excitement in publishing. The thing about niche publishing is it's really cheap. The ethics and the hard work cost nothing. A couple of journos and a small office and a website is, is a relatively low cost. The challenge in the future is working out how to monetize it. Will, be, will it be monetized by private enter, enterprise, by government, by philanthropy? And by the way, the ABC and the SBS are, are a huge asset to Australia. This is the collective view in that respect, in that they do provide a journalist, a service of journalists provided by the government. Um, and the challenge for existing publishers is really interesting here because if they lay off 20 journalists, 
how many of those are going to become their own niche publishers or have their own niche publications and in fact set up in competition uh, and undermine their former employer and looking at i guess in terms of the history and the disruption um effective all 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 press all journalism do you think there are any lessons that traditional journalists could actually learn cheat and steal from those that don't come from a from a traditional press background but still produce content yep a very interesting proposition was put to us through the future of journalism and that is what we can learn from influencers mm. so influencers work to develop say 100,000 followers on say instagram and then they engage with them and they work very hard to monetize mm. that mm -hmm. now journalists traditionally don't do that they publish their stories and sort of some of them almost treat the people who comment on the stories with some disdain you know well it's just the public that's i think in future going to be seen as a important mistake i think um the future of journalism is going to be about people a journalist developing around them a community that is interested in the exploration of information, the debate, as much as learning about what's happening. Not everybody, not everybody, but for instance, if if a political journalist publishes something controversial about the, about the government, why shouldn't um, politicians and other experts on on the particular issue? drop into the story at the end with their commentary and why shouldn't that be um supported it seems like there's a massive challenge um ahead in, in terms of the necessity to to find a, the right balance between um high quality truthful reporting uh interactivity um community involvement and to be honest the realities of the bottom line so in terms of creating a sustainable future for, for both the media, the business the platform, and, and themselves personally as journalists, how do they find that balance? Yeah. So this is, this is uh, so the answer is no one knows. None of the people that we interview really have, a, have that much of a lens on the future. However, one of, one of the things we know is, is the traditional R&D model and which, you know, try, fail, try, fail, try, fail, try, succeed. Um, just keep working at the re research and development. The Jim Kennedy, who was, is the future strategist, strategist for the Associated Press in New York, gave a very interesting example. He said way back, he suggested, so Associated Press sells, me, sells stories to other publishers who then publish. Um, and so he, he put out a message to his clients why don't we set up some kind of aggregation service to aggregate news? Um, and he was ignored. And of course, what happened next was the emergence of Google and Facebook um, and other aggregators. So that was an R&D opportunity missed by the traditional publishers. So the, the publishers, that this is the collective view, the publishers that will make a success are those who are prepared to try new things, constantly test, constantly test. And to say we've got the model right um, for the future now would be, this is the collective view, a mistake. And surely that the model will change over time as further disruption, which unfortunately, as you mentioned, sometimes comes from outside rather than from within. Absolutely, the competition is the, is the danger. So if, the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age say that we're cruising well now, therefore we can relax a bit. And I'm not suggesting that they do, but that that would be a mistake because the, the, the future is changing around them, not inside the companies. Mm -hmm. Look, thank you very much. And on behalf of Media Super, appreciate the opportunity. Um, take care out there. Thanks, Peter. Thank you, mate. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.